Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm really pleased to welcome back to Access Chat Kurt Jaeger. Kurt joined us many moons ago, back in the early years. Um, and for those of you that don't recognize him, you probably haven't been watching TV too much. Kurt is an actor, producer, disability activist and advocate and, and, and value creator in, in the, the movie and television business. So um, had a fascinating conversation last time. You know, you've been in some really large series, NCIS, Mayan, Sons of Anarchy, do loads of uh, other interesting stuff. So, but, but, but please tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background, um, because uh, we, we talked again last week and, and what you're doing now and, and yeah. how you're trying to influence disability inclusion in Hollywood is fascinating. Yeah, well, thanks for having me back on, guys. It's uh, great to see all three of you. Uh, I love the woods. I love the woods you got going on back there. Amazing. Um, no, a lot of really cool projects and things have been going on lately. Uh, I just did a film uh, that came out two or three weeks ago called The Beanie Bubble. That's on, uh, it was uh, Zach Galifianakis and Elizabeth Banks about the rise and fall of the Beanie Baby Empire. You know, those little stupid stuffed dolls. So, uh, played Elizabeth Banks' uh, husband who she leaves for Zach Galifianakis. I mean, come on, really leaving me for that guy? Get get out of here. Anyway, um, so that and then uh, recently uh, shot with uh, Guy Pierce and Alex Pettifer in a film called Sunrise in Ireland. Uh, but since we talked, I did a film in England. I did a film in the UK with the the guys from the In Betweeners. I did the film The Festival. You see that? Oh wow. man, that was a good comedy. Uh, my character was named the Pirate, probably because the prosthetic leg. Um, mm. But uh, uh, I played the uh, American who gets the girl. <laughs> I take the girl from the Brit. <laughs> so, I like that. <laughs> yeah, we've we've um, not been liking that since the Second World War. <laughs> <laughs> it's our it's our melodramatic sing songy voice that they just get, can't uh -huh. get enough of. Um, but yeah, no, like uh, acting's been very very good. Been in a lot of other projects. Um, I just did a NCIS Hawaii. Um, and then, you know, I've written for the last 15 years and it takes about 15 years to start getting good at writing. And in spending that amount of time, as I wrote and made more feature films and more projects, I became a better actor. As I became a better actor, more of the behind the scenes unveiled itself to me that made me want to write other things that made me a better actor in other areas. So it's all been quite circular. Um, but yeah, about me, I mean, I don't know, like born and raised in San Francisco, a former professional BMX rider, um, and I rode BMX in the X Games. Uh, and I was working on my master's in hydrogeology doing research at Berkeley Labs uh, on uh, um, fluvial dynamics of dam removal. Once you remove the dam, how to not kill the downstream ecology while remediating the material, blah, blah, blah. When I had a motorcycle accident and flew off a 40 foot cliff and tore my leg off, broke my pelvis in half, broke my spine in seven spots, uh, broke all my right ribs concussion. ACL, MCL blew apart, uh, deep vein thrombosis and spent three and a half months in the hospital and had uh, 27 surgeries while I was there and another year and a half recovery to then say, I'm going to be an actor. And everyone's like, Kurt, Kurt, how hard did you hit your head? <laughs> That's what my whole family thought. And then they started seeing me in movies and TV and they're like, oh, okay, this is okay. He's not completely a lunatic. I mean, just kind of. So that's, that's, that's me and a gist right now. Wow. That, that is, you have such a powerful story. I love watching your career and I, I do watch your, I missed that one you mentioned. I'm going to go and find that one, but I'm always tracking your career. Cause I think oh, you're the a festival? really good actor. Yeah. Can, yeah. is it, can I see it here in the States? Yeah, yeah, it's a feature okay, film. Good. It's out there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. I'll go look for it because I, I miss that one. I usually watch all your uh, stuff. Oh, and, and, and people might know me from the rudimental video, Waiting All Night. I don't know if you've even seen that. That that music video has won every award. It's now 10 years old and it's still growing. It has over 250 million views on YouTube alone. 
It's wow. insane. It's insane. So, yeah. It's interesting what people like. I But I, I yeah. know that I, I want to say that one thing that I've been – I've been so interested is watching is how I see um, what I perceive. I know nothing about your industry. I am only a consumer, but I perceive that there's a lot of efforts being made in um, to include our actors with disabilities. Uh, sometimes, Kurt, it feels to me like some of the efforts feel a little bit inspirational, pornish. Um, yeah. And I appreciate all yeah. effort, but I um, they, there's quite a few billboards around Los Angeles right now. And and once again, I appreciate all the efforts, but it sometimes it feels to me, Kirk, that maybe we might be confusing people. And so I um, I know we were having some conversations before we got on where you talked about, you know, what is it, how do you get a job as an actor? And I thought maybe you could, in light of there has been progress. But mm -hmm. some of the progress, mm -hmm. actually, some of what people are trying to to help advance us sometimes almost holds us back a little bit and creates some yeah. confusion. And, and you had just mentioned about how now you've been in this business long enough that you've really been peeling those layers back and yeah, understanding yeah. how it works. So I was just wondering if you could just explain a little bit of that perspective to the audience because it's just not something sure. I understood. So maybe others. Yeah, I, I definitely like, there's a lot of nuance to the things I, I've learned. And if I tell you the end answer, you'll be like, Oh, that's not true. It can't be true. But if you take the steps to show it, for instance, when you're starting off as an actor, you're like, okay, how do I get a job? Oh, well, I need an agent. Well, how do I get an agent? Oh, well, I have to have had, jobs oh how do i do this you know and you try to figure out how to make that catch 22 so you try to find any kind of work that you can as an actor you're like i'll go on craigslist i'll take free jobs i'll make my own i don't know i just gotta get, get a couple of projects going and then you take classes and you're just trying to get noticed by anybody and then maybe you put together a reel so that people can like uh, agents can see the work that you're doing because if not, you're saying, hey, I'm a good actor, as opposed to look at my work that I've done. Then they can say, yes, okay, now you get an agent. But you don't have an agent. It's not like it's CAA or ICM or one of the big houses, right? It's like Kurt Yeager's agency extravaganza. Like It's like the, the, the one at the very end. And so you get this audition or you get this, this agent and they're trying to get you roles. A lot of times you start in like commercials or in industrials for corporate companies, you know, uh, the startup work videos, you know, you have, you know, when you get your friend a cup of coffee, don't pour it on his lap. Oh, you know, and it's like that kind of acting, right? You, know, you see those when you have to do the training videos. Um, and then you do a couple of those and they're like, oh, he's got now some time on set he's starting to understand what's going on so let's put uh that person into more commercial auditions so it's like you know a budweiser commercial and like oh he can handle himself there then it's like you're getting an audition in the uh tv or film space as like what's called either a five and under or a co-star and a five and under means five lines or under so hey john what are you doing? Oh, we're going to go to the bar. Cool. Well, there's four. <laughs> that's, that's a huge deal. Now the audience is just like, that's all you did. And so like when you book something like that as an actor, you're like, yeah, right. You're super stoked. And then you tell your family, I'm going to be on, you know, uh, two and a half men. It's going to be amazing. You know, and they're like, oh, great. And then they watch, they're all getting around and then you're on there for a half a second and then you're off and they're like, Oh, that's it. And your whole family just poops on your parade. <laughs> <laughs> so then you're like, no, nah, I got to get more. And then the next you do, you know, four or five of those. Now, cast and director's like, okay, that person's done like five auditions. That's cool. Or five roles. Let's see if he can handle like more material, a guest star role. You know, something that like has more of a character arc inside of an episode. You know, and then it's like, okay, you do a couple of those and then you get something called recurring. So it's a guest star with an arc, but that happens over multiple episodes. Then you get to the next level, which is uh, 
uh, a regular, a series regular on a TV show where you're in virtually every episode and you have arcs and they go on. And that's in the TV side. In the film business, it still goes up to being the lead and the star and everything else. Then there are like, you know, you could be the lead of a show and it sounds like it's the pinnacle of your career, but then you never work again. So right. it's pretty brutal. So that's like the normal actor arc. The difficulty with disabilities is that a lot of actors with their agents and the demands of a casting director are to be reading very specific people types. You know, they're like, hey, we need to have a Norwegian who speaks Spanish and uh, understands some Swahili. That's a pretty specific act defined with some credits, right? And that specificity, needing those things, or at least someone who can portray it so well, is really hard to find. And so because those are so hard to find, you get a little further and further and further away from the truth in order to be able to make those projects happen. So take that specificity and then say non-disabled is a category and disabled is a category. So when they audition people for a able-bodied written role, they're probably going to see almost exclusively able-bodied actors. When they then see disabilities, they will see some disabled actors or actors with disabilities, whichever you prefer. And if they're not quite finding that person, they're gonna audition all those other people who have a ton more experience, a ton more credits, and a ton of more personal time with those directors and writers and the casting people. So they'll probably get the job, and that's where you see most actors with non-disabilities playing disabled roles. And so the problem is that an actor with a disability isn't getting the same auditioning time in the room practicing their auditioning skills not acting acting is on set this is a specific skill set of getting used to reading five pages of dialogue in a couple of hours being able to disseminate it and then give some kind of a performance in just a few minutes that shows that you know how the character could be for 10 whole episodes. And that's really hard to do if you're auditioning once every two or three months. You don't start feeling the rhythm of what people want. Your agents don't have enough info to give you. It's like saying you're gonna go out and do some kind of statistical analyses of something and you're like, oh, our pool of uh, uh, of uh, uh, numerics are three. Like your that your your data pool is not big enough. You need ten thousand before you start going. Oh, I see a pattern. So that's sort of like the major problem. And the thing is, is when a lot of the organizations come at trying to fix this, they're saying you need to audition uh, disabled actors. You need to see them. You need to create these opportunities. You need to work with them. And it's all accurate. It's just coming at it from a charitable perspective. It's coming about it from like a, um, um, you'll feel good. It's the right thing to do, which is important. But I don't think most people understand that the definition of a capital corporation is to make money. And, and what I mean is that's not their purpose. It is their legal requirement to primarily focus on making money. Like if they, if, if according to American law, if they don't do everything they can to make as much money as they can, they can be sued and like the CEO can be removed from the company. Yeah. And people don't even know that. Yeah. So, so, you know, this is, this is where, you know, you know, people talk about the movie business and don't mm -hmm. really appreciate how much of its business more than movies. Um, because yeah. it, you know, th there's a whole massive finance behind it 
and, and the fiduciary responsibility of the the directors and the organizers and the funders and everything else and yeah yeah if you're if you're part of a, a, a publicly floated company you you have, you have a responsibility. to you have to maximize shareholder value yeah. it's your legal responsibility there are other legal responsibilities but it's the one that often takes precedence over everything else and yeah yeah. So, so, so if, you, if you go if you go at it from a charitable perspective, then you're not going after the company's primary interest. Yeah, you're, you're then, already yeah. accidentally self defeating, right? Yeah. You could say, hey, there's a monetary element. You know, there's 175 billion dollars in discretionary spending from a American right. disabled person that they could. There's value in it, so on, so. But there's no proven model that shows that it'll translate. So no company is going to stop what they're doing and go, oh, now let's do this other thing. It's just, it's, so you got to come at it from a whole different angle. And it's not wrong what they're doing per se. It's just, I think that they've, they've maximized the ability of their purposes in order to get the results of education, right? Like they're, they're trying to educate people. And that is, Part of the way you get someone to see a business model is first educate. But if you're not pitching the business model, then you're educating in your a vacuum. Okay, Kurt, let's say that you know uh, we have a, a young actor listening to us, uh, and they, they they are following your lead. How yeah. can they? How can how can a young actor that doesn't want to pursue that charity model? How can he break the ice? He or she break mm -hmm. the ice? Well, part of it is realizing that, like Neil was saying, this is the film business, right? The word business is three times as long as the word film. Business is all work. So 75% of this is for sure all work. Then film is part work <laughs> and part art. So the remaining 25% is half and half. So it's... Um, 12.5% art and 12.5% business. So you have what, 85 ish percent or whatever it is, the 90%, you know, that's just work. So the thing I tell young actors or even old actors a lot, you have to do the thing. You can start acting when you're 50 and you can make it. There are people who started at 55 and then became a star at 65. Don't think that it's too late. Who cares? Do whatever you want with your life. You got one life, so do whatever you want. But I always tell people, if the film business is 85% business, then you need to be 85% business. So if you put your business affairs in orders, I would say if you want to start acting, take classes, read every single book. There's literally 50 books on acting alone that you could read that would take you two years. Do that. Take some classes. But while you're doing that, get three jobs. And work and save up all your money so that you have a war chest. So that when you come out here and you want to start auditioning and the job that you're working at is like, well, we can't let you go to that audition. We need you, Tom. Right? And you're like, I got to go. And they're like, yo, if you leave, you're quitting. And you're like, I have plenty of money, so enjoy. And you leave. You're giving yourself the financial opportunity to invest time back into yourself. So by working three jobs to put, you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars in the bank that just can keep you alive for a long period of time, that's going to allow you to drop the hat, go to a party in Vegas that a producer invited you to, that will actually change your career. Because in this business, people want to work with people they know, and the reason why they want to work with people they know is it's like owning a house and having your pipes burst, who do you call? The plumber you know, right? That's what you do. You call and you're like, ah, my, my, right? And if not, you call someone who's handy, who's knows that, who, who knows who to call. So you don't just go through the phone book or whatever and go, let me see, mother, look at all this water coming in. Anyways, let me be really calm about it. Like the film business is put like a film set is like putting out a fire. You need firemen all over the place. You need your actor to come on set and be such a good person that if somebody is having a problem, they can put that fire out 
and then do their primary job. So from like the financial aspect of a young actor, learn and read everything that you can. Reading is free after you buy the book. Most of the stuff online is out there. So just read everything, but then put your finances in order so that you can give yourself a long runway. People don't realize that 85% of the majority of actors that have made it come from capital. So what it allows them to do between, let's say, usually they're young, they break in, between the age of 20 and 27, is they're auditioning and hanging out, auditioning and hanging out, auditioning and hanging out, and they might not have a primary job. But what they're doing is they're hanging out with all the young producer, director, writers as they come up. Then you see these like 32 year olds break out. You're like, oh, where'd they come from? Well, they were friends with those guys, but they had a long runway. And usually people who have a long runway come from capital. So I would suggest to the young actor, work and put some money in the bank while you're gathering all the knowledge. Then to really break in, it's hang out at the places they're hanging out go to the film festivals. If you go to any film, wherever you live, you go to all the local film festivals and you go there with a notepad or your computer and you pay attention to every single person that's writing and producing and directing, just at a local film festival, you'll see 10 or 20 excited people trying to make art. Then what you do is you go, okay, how do I make this art into a business? And then you work with three or four of those people. And now all of a sudden you have your own internal group of really fun people that you're learning from. And you start like kind of building that. You're at a film festival and you meet like two or three people. You go up to them, hey, it was a five minute film. Your five minute film was amazing. I'd love to make something with you. Oh, I would, I would too. They're just as excited as you. Remember that you're an actor, a producer, a writer, a director and an executive want to find someone like you to work with, but they're not bigger than you. They're not more important than you. And the second that you flip that in your mind, now you can be a relaxed actor and you can say, Hey, let's work together. Like now I have confidence in Kirk cause he's being chill. Right. As opposed to like, I want to act. Can I act? Watch. I can act. I can act. I can act. And you're like, all right, all right. Okay. You know, like you just need to get to that chill spot. So, so, so this is great advice on a, on a personal level. But, but we we talked before about you know the business, and yeah. and and business is not just a business; it's a, an entire industry. It's like a machine. And and, and I know that off air we talked about you know, uh, some of the things that you're doing to enable and support inclusion by working with that machine and, and, and understanding the aspects of business. So can you tell us a bit more about yeah. that aspect of what you're doing? Because I think it's fascinating and really a uh, smart thing. Yeah, I mean, look, the machine, I'll, I'll start like general, right? The machine of the film business is to make money. We're not in the business to, you know, maybe, maybe there's a small percentage that is to win awards. Because if you win an Oscar, right, you'll be able to make money. So you're either trying to make money or you're trying to do something so that you can make money. Like the ultimate goal is to make money. And when you realize that and you realize the structure of the film business is to make money, you start seeing yourself as an actor or a writer in a different light. You're like, okay, how do I write what I want to write? But for audiences that can have an access point into the script, into the story so that people can get into my world and learn it. But really what I'm doing is making it so that people will want to watch it and pay for it so that I can keep making more and more projects. Then as an actor, you're like, okay, well, what's my value? How do I do something? That's why I got to get a hundred thousand followers on social media. You know, that's why if I can do that, then a producer is going to go, imagine this, you have an actor A and an actor B. Actor A is great. Actor B is great. Actor A has 100,000 followers. Actor B doesn't. If everything's being equal and someone else is doing the social media personal branding work, then you know they're going to do the personal branding work for your film because they're already doing it. 
but then you know they at least have 100,000 eyes for your film. So now you're like, well, all things being equal, why wouldn't you go with the more useful choice? And so really it's primarily trying to be as useful as you can, building up whatever you can. Then on the filmmaking side, there's a whole nother level to how to do that. You start reinvesting yourself, your own money as an actor into your own film projects, right? You get paid in kind of a duality way. Oh, I made a million dollars on a film. Well, pay me, Kurt Yeager, the actor, half a million dollars, and then I'll pay some taxes on it, but then pay my production company half a million dollars. And then I roll this money over into the next production so that I get myself more and more work. And then the value of Kurt Yeager is Kurt Yeager, oh, all these credits, and he's got 100,000 followers on social media, and he's got a half a million dollars to put in our film. I think we're going to hire Kurt Yeager. It, it changes the game. It makes it completely different. So Brad Pitt, like, you think, oh, he's an actor, he's an actor, he's an actor. Why don't you just, all of you can do this. Look up the production company called Plan B. That's his production company. Look at what it's been involved in. Every single one of his projects, except Quentin Tarantino. So he's rolled over his own finances into his own finances. If you look at someone like uh, Ryan Reynolds or The Rock, they roll their own production dollars that have made so much money into production money that they made sub businesses that aren't even a part of the film business, whether it's tequila or it's uh, Ryan, Ryan Reynolds has uh, aviation gin. And then now he owns a soccer club that then came full circle by making a TV show about his soccer club. You see them so, like it's all feeding itself. So you, when you start seeing these, these feeding cycles, you start realizing this is the true business behind the business. And then once you have enough of these businesses, for instance, let's say I'm a studio and I'm going to put money into production. Uh, well, there's these things called post-production. Well, we need post-production facilities. Well, if I own those facilities and I need to keep those people employed, I might make one or two feature films that just keeps them employed all year round. Now, it's not going to make me any money, so I can take a loss on these two crappy films that I made, and I can deduce that from my net income to give me a lower taxable gross with this company, but I still fed my other primary company. And, so and it's this, like this yeah this is where you get the art house projects it's like this is where i yeah. get to do creative work and i can take a tax loss on this and and i can feed the beast some more yeah. yeah so if you start understanding that and you start really grasping the totality of the biz the true business model of, of the film business then you come up with an idea like uh, my foundation. <laughs> uh, you like that little segue? Um, and, and you realize, oh my gosh, how do I capitalize disabilities? How do I make valuable disabilities? How do I showcase not the value to them? How do I prove the value? So started a company that is primarily driven at showcasing the value of disabled talent in front of and behind the camera, building the foundation's coffers. So anybody out there, we should have a conversation. Um, it's a tax write-off. We can talk about that model. I'm not going to talk about it publicly, but I'll tell you privately. It's a good model. Um, and what we do is we basically take capitalization and we directly juxtapose that to a contractual obligation with productions to include disabled talent. And we're not saying do it for charity, do it because we want to. We identify the disabled talent. We say, oh yeah, uh, Marley Matlin won an Oscar, did this, I want her in that film. Well, it's not a deaf character, doesn't matter. And they're like, well, and I'm like, well, here's some money. And they're like, okay, yes, absolutely, yes, we'll do it, we'll do it. And I'm like, because I'm capitalizing the business. I'm excluding the charity. I'm excluding the, you should do this. You should do, I'm saying, look, I, I got tired of listening to everyone saying what Hollywood should do. And I was like, okay, well, what should I do? What should I do to change this? What, how do I capitalize? If I, Kurt Yeager, believe that Kurt Yeager is valuable, then, and I believe that, then I go, okay, how do I prove my value? Then I go, well, 
I get a lot of work as an actor and a writer. My friends with the other disabilities don't because I have a very light disabled act, uh, disabled uh, viewpoint from the world. I am a lower leg amputee. That's like a paper cut in the disabled world, right? And so I am treated like disabled light. Like, ah, oh, he's, he's, I, mean, I, I almost forget Kurt's disabled. Like, thanks for the compliment, I think. What's disabled mean anyways? Anyways, <laughs> going back to this, I go, well, if I know that there are really talented people with disabilities in front of and behind the camera, I've read some of their stuff that's not getting made. And I've seen some directors directing things that aren't getting seen because they're doing art, not business. And I see actors that are talented. They're singing, they're dancing, they're, they're, they're doing Shakespeare in the park. They're doing these things and it's not translating into the business. But I see all this value and it's truly there. Well, then I need to prove it. If I believe it, then I need to put my time, energy and money into it. So that's what I started doing. Did a couple of projects based on it, put my own money into a, the, the, the fund. Did a couple small projects to prove its model. It worked. Raised a half a million dollars. Did it again. And everyone's like, whoa, you're doing something different. And I'm like, yeah, I'm doing business. I'm going to use the charitable arm of being able to accept money through a 501c3 and being able to accept money that everyone who donates gets to have a tax write-off. So you get a full tax write-off on your capital. It doesn't matter how big it is. It's a million dollar check. Great. You get, you get it. You want to do a million dollars over four years. So uh, a quarter of a million every year. You get, you get, great. Whatever you want to take the tax break, it's your business. It's not a weird amortized thing that you invest in. Even if you plan on losing the money and you can only take 33% per year and whatever, you don't have to worry about that. So now you could dump all your money into something from a charity perspective, but you're putting it into a company that is primary mission is to make money to primarily put people with disabilities in primary dominant roles inside the industry. And then what ends up happening is it's a rolling fund that keeps going. It's, its primary purpose is to grow, not to do charity. And the difference in those two models is when you do charity, as, listen, I'm not knocking charity. It is important. It is extremely important. But charity, you go, hey, I need $100,000 this year to say, feed some children. Great. Thank you. I'm going to feed the children. Feeding the children doesn't cost $100,000. Feeding the children probably costs $60,000. And you had some overhead. You had to have the people that made the food, that volunteered maybe, but you still had to rent facilities. You had to get some insurance. You had to pay all this other money to be able to feed $60,000 worth of kids. And then you're like, okay, we need another $100,000 next year. With us, we get the money and we invest in the projects with expected three angles of return. We have our primary principal fund, our equity fund, and then ticket sales and profit on the backside. And then we wrap that around to then say, oh, next year we get to do three more people with disabilities in front of or behind the camera. And we don't need any more of your money. If you'd like to give, please do, but we don't need it. Now we've, we've absolved the primary problem with donations, donation fatigue. Yeah. Now you're like, I put... I put a half a million dollars into Kurt's thing and that's all I did. And he turned it into 750 and then a million and then a million too. And it's doing the job also. Let's do it again. And now everyone's excited because they didn't do something that like, I don't know, I want to say this, but like, you know, some jerk off kid that you keep giving money to that doesn't like do anything with their life. Like this kid you gave money to, and now it's doing something. It's doing something it's doing that now something you can be proud incredible. of. Because, yeah, you put the fuel in the engine, and somehow or another that car and the fuel found more fuel and didn't need any more fuel. Like you're, you're investing into the mind of Kurt Yeager's 20 years of experience in the business, not charity, not disabilities. I just happen to be disabled. That's my primary mission between all of us and all of the viewers. Yeah. I don't give a shit about money. It just doesn't do anything for me. Like I've had my near death experience and so I can't take it with me. Do I like nice things? Yeah, but that's not my primary purpose. 
I use money as a means to be able to do what I want to do or buy back life, buy back time, not Mm -hmm. buy more motorcycles. I've got plenty of those things. Like I make plenty of money as an actor. So this is like a different way to think about driving at the solution. And the solution is business, not charity. Yeah. The money is a tool, not an end in itself. Yeah. Well, it's, and and, and it's, you have to keep it going because without the tool, you, you, you don't get the results, but it's not, it's not the the end result. It's it's enabling you to do what you need to do, but you have to keep you have to keep the investment. I I know we would normally have finished by now, but Antonio's got a question. This is a fascinating chat, so go for it. Yeah. So, uh, what impact do you expect this can have in lives of of the people uh, that you are trying to promote into the acting career? <clears throat> Well, there's so much of an impact. And I love this question. Thank you, Antonio. Because last year, according to the Annenberg Foundation and GLAAD report, there were three actors in films, notable films that had a disability. Three. A total of three. Three. All the films, three. So when we have our fund, and I just do, let's say, a quarter million dollars, and that affects one actor, I've already increased representation by 33%. That's an insane increase from such a small amount of money. And as I grow the fund, I'll be growing it to 10%, 15%, 50%, 100% so fast that let's say, let's say I raise 2.5 million by tomorrow. I'll have affected the film industry by 330% overnight. But what's different about this is we're not affecting it and then it goes away. We're increasing the, so this is the Y axis, this is the X axis. We're increasing the new floor. We're taking X and adding it to X's of one. We're increasing the entire X axis. So where there was only three actors with disabilities, we are going to add 10 and say this 10 is where it remains because our fun continues. Mm-hmm. So as that continues, we're creating a new baseline, then 10, then 12, then 13. And that increases, the X's of one increases to X's of two, X's of three, right? Based on our fund and revolving fund. But then a donor sees what we're doing. They're like, wow, that's really cool. We want to dump in. Then it jumps to another level because of that. Yeah. And that's just a standard model of growth. What ends up happening is if one of the film takes off, like the indie film, and let's say it takes off like the film um, um, Sound of Freedom, you know, they made like, they made $10 million, whatever it is, and it made $100 million and still is making more money. Well, we would have 10% of that equity and our film fund would jump by 10 million. Wow. So then so- we have now an effective rate of saying, hey, we have a film fund of $10 million and all the film industry is all about making money. They say, hey, we want to have some roles uh, for role, people with disabilities in exchange for money. I'm like, great, now that we have this power, I want three actors with disabilities and I want the first AD, which is the assistant director. I want the first AD to be disabled. Well, Kurt, we're really having a hard time finding, here's a list. <laughs> uh, we don't really have any excuses, do we? And they can't say no, because if they do, then they're not doing their fiduciary responsibility that they have to do because they're a corporation. They can't say no to good money because then they can get sued by their shareholders. So that's why it all functions. So what we end up doing instead of from an actor's perspective going to school, working your ass off, trying to get all these things. And then once you have enough experience to even get into the audition space, not getting an audition, we're bypassing the audition process. We're just saying, all right, I'm going to hook you up. Hey, look, I know you're a small actor, but I saw you in that play. And that was really, really good. So we're going to take $100,000 and we're going to give you like a little tiny role in three little films. So it's a four liner. We're just going to just see how you go. So essentially the fun becomes like everybody's with a disability is rich uncle. Mm-hmm. So I facilitate the means of finding talent and talent owes me nothing. They don't pay me anything. 
there's no obligation to me. If they end up hating me because they don't like my attitude, congratulations. It doesn't matter to me. It, it means nothing to me. I want to take nothing from disabled talent. Nothing. It's just like the, the one scene in um, Band of Brothers. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. Uh, the, the second guy uh, who's like the, the main character and then his like buddy that's drinking the whole time and going through. Um, he's gambling and like winning and uh, with, with some guys that are going to go off and, sh and go to war. And he says, listen, I don't want you gambling. He's like, we're just having some fun. And he says, no, you're their superior officer and you're not supposed to take anything from them. I, they've already given enough. Don't take anything from them. So what we're doing with this is we're not requiring you to come to our classes as a disabled talent. We're, we're requiring you to go do good job. That's it. Like just do some good stuff. So, but th that's how it works for disabled talent in front of the camera. As we start building the fund, the money that comes back in, I consider that house oh. money. Yeah. Oh, we got to go. Oh, yeah, Deborah's, Deborah's going to drop off. But, um, and ah, we'll okay. At the end of but, it. But it's such a rich conversation, Kirk, so I don't want to interrupt you, but it's such a rich conversation. No, it's okay. And we need this, and our community needs to help you fund this, too. So, we'll, so, talk, well, we'll talk offline. Give me a, give me a holler. We'll talk. Oh, soon, yeah. Deborah. I definitely want to talk to you. I love it. So, so we'll, I, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just finish up because I think that the, the, the stuff that you're talking about. Um, Hi, behind man. Me, my name's Kurt Yeager. Good night. <laughs> no, 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 no. Cool. Um, but well, I do I'll, think I'll that, finish up real. I'll make it really quick. But I, but I do think the point you're making about behind yeah. the camera is also important because we often talk about representation in front of camera, but but the the whole infrastructure behind camera. There's a you know there's a lack of of jobs and opportunities for people with disabilities in that space too. So so that's that's equally important. It's it's equally as important, but it's a harder accomplishment, which is why I'm going the the talent route first, because mm -hmm. the development and the responsibility of a single writer or a single director or a single producer with a disability means that they can manage and control 30 actors yeah. where one actor doing their job, you know, that's a little less responsibility in the early stages. So it's more about getting that person and those people along the way. But as I get talent in front of the camera, I can get some behind the camera. And there are a few out there like Jenny Gold, Ashley Eakin, Jordan Hogg, right? Like there's some people out there that are already working. But why are they doing 70 episodes of television instead of being the next big feature film director? They should already be, they're so talented. They should already be at the top. So someone like Jordan Hogg, I can be like, hey, I'm going to back one of your new films. Here's a million dollars. And then it literally primarily gives him that monetary value that we know he has and it proves the industry when he makes money that he's a valuable commodity yeah i'm just i'm just you know i don't know the right term but um what is it where you you prove the value of a commodity yeah you know yeah. like you proof of worth it's 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 that um yeah. You know, you you you've proved the market. It's you've 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 seeded the market, and and I think that you know when you break open that that new market with a new product or a new person being a product, you know, we're talking about ourselves as package. You're talking about packaging yourself as an actor. You're a product. You're part of yeah. that um, system, right? Um, you know, you've proved the worth of that product, and then people want to buy into it. So I. That, I, I, I totally get it. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a, I think it's a really exciting project, um, and I think that you know, we'll definitely want to revisit this. Um, so thank well, you. And, I, and just so you know, like my advisory board is like legit. I mean, we yeah. got you know, huge showrunners, huge producers. I mean, Winona Judd is one of our advisory board. You know, six times Grammy, nineteen number one hit songs, etc. Daniela Rua from NCIS uh, LA, uh, Brandon Sonier, showrunner, director. Like, there's so, like, these people are like, uh, let's do this. Like, let's do this.
Yeah, these, these are these are sort of bona. Uh, if we were taking the business analogy, this is not your corner shop owner. You know, these are people exactly. that own big conglomerates. So yeah, it's 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 a fantastic thing that you're doing. I, I, I think the insights you've given us have been fantastic and fascinating. I wish you great luck. I'll be back in touch because we're we're going to talk about this again for sure. I need to thank yes. Amazon for for supporting us and my clear text for keeping us captioned and accessible. So thank you very much, Kurt. It's been a pleasure to talk with you again. Thank you for coming back on Access Chat. Neil, thank you. Antonia, thank you. Love it. Let's talk offline. Will do.